Linear Second Order Differential Equations, Section 8.6 from your textbook by Edwards and Penny. And here we have a picture of a circuit board. And if you're going to be studying electrical engineering, for example, you're going to run into lots of differential equations. From Wikipedia, a differential equation is a mathematical equation that relates some function of one or more variables with its derivatives. Differential equations arise whenever a deterministic relation involving some continuously varying quantities modeled by functions and their rates of change in space and or time expressed as derivatives is known or postulated. Because such relations are extremely common, differential equations play a prominent role in many disciplines including engineering, physics, economics, and biology. So here are some examples of differential equations. Now the first one is called a third order differential equation because it has a third derivative in it. And the second one is called a first order differential equation because it only has the first derivative in it. And can you guess what the third one is? I thought you said that, first order differential equation. What about the fourth one? Yes, it's a second order differential equation because it has a second derivative in it. Now notice that the first one has a third derivative and the first derivative in it. So we name it by the highest number derivative that appears in the equation. So we're going to review first order separable differential equations, which were the only kind of differential equations that you studied in your previous course. For example, we could have dy dx equals y, which is an extremely simple differential equation, but a differential equation nonetheless because it has a derivative in it. Here's a picture of the um, slope field for that derivative. All the slopes are equal to the y values, and so you don't have any change as you move along um, horizontally, but they change and get steeper as you move vertically. Now in the old days then, how would we solve this? Well, this is called separable because we're able to rearrange it uh, by separating the y's and the x's on opposite sides of the equation. And then what we do is we integrate both sides and we end up with the natural log of the absolute value of y equaling x plus c. We only need a constant on one side because the two constants can be combined. And then we apply the anti-log to both sides and we can rewrite e to the x plus c as e to the x times e to the c and rename um, e to the c a. And then if we remove the absolute values, we can put a plus or minus, but we don't, we don't really need the plus or minus because a could be a negative. But in my previous statement, it was a positive value and that's why I included the plus or minus there. Now notice that our solution to this first order differential equation has one unknown constant in it because we have a family of possible solutions. If we have a particular point given to us, initial conditions, then we could solve for A. Now guess how many unknown constants we end up with in our solution to second order differential equations? Did you say two? Well, we're going to find out that that is in fact correct. Okay, so let's move on to a new topic. Linear second order differential equations. Now it's a little hard to tell why these are considered linear, why they named them linear. Later on you'll kind of see, but a linear second order differential equation is of the form an expression in x times the second derivative plus an expression in x times the first derivative plus an expression in x times the original function equals another expression x. So notice that none of the coefficients have y's in them. A homogeneous linear second order differential equation is the same thing except that on the right we have an expression in x which is just zero and that makes uh, solving these a lot easier. Well what does it mean to solve a differential equation? That means finding all y equal f of x that satisfy the given equation. And that brings us to a theorem. If y1 and y2 are both solutions to a homogeneous linear second order differential equation, then y of x equal constant times the first solution plus a constant times the second solution is also a solution. Proof. 
Well, we're given that y1 and y2 both satisfy the homogeneous linear second order differential equation. So I've substituted y1 and then y2 into that format. Now let's see what our um, equation looks like when we substitute y into it. And to uh, make it appear on the screen a little better, I'm, I changed from Leibniz notation to uh, y double prime for uh, the second derivative and y prime for the first derivative so it would fit on the screen a little better. And if you take the derivative of y, you get cy1 prime plus c2y2 prime. And if you take the second derivative, you get uh, c1y double prime plus c2y double prime. And so I just substituted what those values would be on the right there. Now we can rearrange that by collecting all the y1 terms and all the y2 terms. And then we see that, in fact, what we have in the parentheses matches the given. Just a different notation, that's all. And so both of those parentheses, according to what was given, are equal to 0. So we get c1 times 0 plus c2 times 0 equals 0. So our solution of y satisfies the homogeneous linear second order differential equation form, QED. Definition. Solutions y1 and y2 are said to be independent if their variable parts are different. What do we mean by different? Well, for example, x and x squared are independent because those variables are different. e to the x and e to the 2x are different variables, so those solutions would be independent for the same reason x and x squared are different. e to the x and x squared are independent. Those are obviously different variable parts. Sine x and cosine are independent, but 5x cubed and 12x cubed are not independent. Just because the coefficient's different, the variable parts are identical. So those would not be independent solutions. Now, that being said, we can look at an example. A, verify that y1 equal x squared and y2 equal x to the negative 3 are independent solutions for this differential equation. B. Find the specific solution for which y of 1 is 10 and y prime of 1 is 5. So if y1 is x squared, then that means that y1 prime is 2x and y1 double prime is just 2. And so what we're going to do is we're going to substitute those values in our differential equation. And we'll get x squared times 2 plus 2x times 2x minus 6x squared. And if you do the arithmetic there, you get 2x squared plus 4x squared minus 6x squared, and that does equal 0. The second solution, second independent solution, y2 prime would be negative 3x to the negative 4, and y2 double prime then would be 12, positive 12x to the negative 5. Again, we're going to substitute into our differential equation. And if you do the math there, you get 12x to the negative 3 minus 6x to the negative 3 minus another 6x to the negative 3, and that is, again, 0. OK, so part b, by the previous theorem, y of x could equal c1y1 plus c2y2. Uh, that's also a solution. So let's see if that's going to work. In particular, y of 1 is 10. So if I substitute 1 for x, I get um, c1 times 1 plus c2 times 1, and so that has to equal 10. Then looking at the derivative, the derivative of y would be 2c1x minus 3 times c2x to the negative 4. Now substituting a 1 in there, I'm supposed to get 5, and so I get 5 equals 2c1 minus 3c2, because x is, is 1 in this case. So now we just have uh, two linear equations to solve for c1 and c2. So I'm going to multiply my top equation by 3, and then add it to the bottom equation. And so when I add, I get 35 equals 5c1, which means c1 is 7. And then you can use either equation to solve for c2. So what's our final answer then? Our specific solution is y equals 7x squared, because that's c1, plus 3x to the negative 3, because we've got c2 times the second independent solution. Now we have a second theorem that says every homogeneous linear second order differential equation has two independent solutions, y1 and y2, 
and furthermore, all solutions are of the form y of x equals c1y1 plus c2y2. In other words, before the theorem said that this uh, linear combination would be a solution, now it says that in fact there will be exactly two independent solutions and this linear combination of those two independent solutions covers all possible solutions to our homogeneous linear second order differential equation. Proof. Oops, I lied. The proof to this is beyond the scope of this course. So now we're going to look at a specific type of uh, homogeneous linear second order differential equation. Solving for all solutions when a, b, and c are constants. In other words, um, instead of expressions in x in front of the derivatives, we just have real numbers in front of the derivatives. And in fact, this is the only type that we are going to solve directly in this section, that is. Strategy. Replace y double prime, y prime, and y with r squared r and 1 respectively, and I'll show you in a minute why this actually works. Case 1, when we set up our quadratic equation, we find that we have two different real solutions, r1 and r2, in which case the general solution is of the form c1 e to the r1x plus c2 e to the r2x. Case 2, our quadratic equation has one unique real solution, r, in which case the general solution is of the form c1e to the rx plus c2xe to the rx, or you can factor out e to the rx and write the solution uh, the way shown on the right. And then finally, obviously, case 3 would be what? Well, that would be when our quadratic um, equation has two imaginary solutions of the form p plus or minus qi, and then the general solution to our um, linear differential equation above would be of the form e to the px times the quantity c1 cosine qx plus c2 sine qx. All right, now to actually develop this strategy and uh, figure out why it works is a little tricky, but what we're going to do is we're going to take a look just at case one, and I'm going to show you that it does in fact work. We're not going to develop these formulas. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this solution and um, plug it into our differential equation and show that it does equal zero. And so we need the derivatives. So the first derivative you would bring r1 down in front of that first term and r2 down in front of the second term. And then for the second derivative you would do it again so you would end up with an r1 squared in front of the first uh, term and an r2 squared in front of the second one. So here's what it looks like when we substitute. We have a times the second derivative of y plus b times the first derivative of y plus c times just y. Now what we're going to do is we're going to collect all the terms that have an e to the r1x and a c1 in them and all the terms that have a c2 e to the r2x in them and factor that out and when you do that look what's left. Well you have the quadratic equations above and we just said that these were that r1 and r2 were the roots so if we plug those roots in what do we get well both of those quantities are zero so the result is zero and zero is what we wanted qed quod erat demonstratum now you can do the same thing with case 2 and case 3 to show that those solutions are valid and we have a theorem that says they have to be the only solutions but uh, it's a lot messier so we'll just skip that now here's a picture that reminded me of the differential equations course. What happens is in differential differential equations course for a whole semester you look at more and more different types of differential equations and you come up uh, you, you come up with uh, more and more different uh, formulas or rather you don't come up with them they're in the text and the text shows you why they work and so all you have to do is figure out what what type is this and therefore what does the solution look like and so on and that's about it. Okay, so now we're going to look at some problems. Number two, find all solutions for this differential equation. And so it's of the type that we can solve directly using the uh, r squared r technique. And so when we substitute r squared for y double prime and r for y prime, look what we get. That factors nicely. And so this is case one. We have 
two distinct real zeros. And case one reads this way, and so all you have to do then is plug into the solution, and we get y equals c1 e to the 3x plus c2 e to the negative 5x. Now, remember we said that when it was a first order differential equation, you ended up with one unknown constant in your answer unless you were given um, initial conditions. Notice that since this is a second order differential equation, you end up with two unknown constants, c1 and c2. Now if you're given initial conditions, then, it's, uh, then you can uh, solve for c1 and c2 and come up with a specific solution. Number eight, find all solutions to this um, differential equation. So again, we're going to use our strategy of substituting r squared and r, and then y just goes to one. And that factors nicely into a perfect square, and so we have case two, which is one real solution. And so in case two, our solution looks like this. And again, we just substitute 5 thirds for r, and we're done. Number 12, find all solutions for this homogeneous linear second order differential equation. Well, that's a mouthful, isn't it? So again, we're going to solve um, the quadratic equation. And this time it didn't factor, so I used the quadratic formula and got 5 plus or minus 7i. I bet you would have guessed that this one was going to be case 3. I just wanted to do at least one of each. And so our general uh, solution looks like this. So what is p? Well, p is the real part of the solution, and q is the um, absolute value of the coefficient of i. So we substitute those numbers, and there you have it. Number 20, find the particular solution for this homogeneous linear second order differential equation, given that y of 0 is 6 and y prime of 0 is negative 11. So we have still the same first step. We substitute r squared for y double prime and r for y prime. And that factors into a perfect square, so we have one real solution, negative 7 thirds. And so that's case 2. And I didn't put the whole box there, but you know, uh, you know what it is by now, or at least you have it written down. So we just substitute uh, negative 7 thirds for r. Now we want to find the particular solution. So we're going to first use the fact that y of 0 is 6. And if I substitute 0 for x, I get c1 times 1 plus c2 times 0 times 1. So pretty obviously, c1 is 6. And then we're going to use the fact that y prime of 0 is negative 11. So what's the derivative? Well, there's the derivative. It looks messy, but it's actually rather easy. I did have to use the product rule on that second term, though. So I'm glad they gave us 0 for the x value, aren't you? So substituting 0, we get this equation. And the middle term is 0. And I didn't show all the steps, but you end up getting c2 equals 3. So now all we have to do is substitute c1 and c2 in the equation up there highlighted in pink. And there's our final answer. This is the specific or particular solution given the initial conditions above. Number 34, given this solution, hmm, find the original homogeneous linear second order differential equation. Well, this looks like case 3, does it not? Yes. And so the um, roots for the quadratic uh, equation would be negative 1 fifth plus or minus 5i, right? And so we'll put those in as the roots. Um, and then I simplified, the, I distributed the negative sign. And then if you multiply that out, you do r times each of the terms in the second parentheses. And then I did 1 fifth times all the terms in the second parentheses. This is a little bit tedious. And then I multiplied negative 5i times all the terms in the other parentheses, and then we simplify. Things cancel, and that's nice. And we end up with r squared plus 2 fifths r plus 626 25 ths. 
So now we have to morph backwards from the quadratic to the original um, differential equation. So we just substitute y double prime for r squared, y prime for r, and then don't forget to put y in front of that last coefficient. And then if you don't like the fractions, you can multiply through by 25. Okay, so from Wikipedia, I wanted to talk a little bit about Lazarus Emanuel Fuchs because he is one of the mathematicians involved in differential equations way back over 100 years ago. He was a German mathematician who's contributed important research in the field of linear differential equations. He was born in Moschen, Mosina, and died in Berlin, Germany. He was buried in Schoenberg in the St. Matthew's Cemetery and his grave in Section H is preserved and listed as a grave of honor of the state of Berlin. Fuchs is also known for Fuchs' theorem, which states that the differential equation a of x times the second derivative plus b of x times the first derivative plus c of x y equals zero, does that look familiar? Mm -hmm. Has at least one solution of the form. And then this is a, an, an infinite series. That's pretty scary. And there's what Mr. Fuchs looks like. Also from Wikipedia, Gabriel Leon Jean Baptiste Lamay was a French mathematician who contributed to the theory of partial differential equations by the use of curvilinear coordinates. Lamay became well known for his general theory of curvilinear coordinates and his notation and study of classes of ellipse-like curves, now known as Lamé curves or super ellipses, with this equation. He also proved a special case of Fermat's last theorem, and he actually thought that he had found a complete proof for the theorem, but his proof was flawed. It was, however, uh, proved later by an English mathematician. Now, a couple things to point out. Um, Partial differential equations have to do with multivariable functions, so we'll be looking at partial derivatives later. And also notice that the equation for his super ellipses looks similar to the equation for regular ellipse, except that n is 2 in that case. And here is a picture of Mr. Lamay, a very serious looking fella. So that's it for this lesson. We will end with a joke. Differential equations. After you. No, after you. Please be my guest. Oh, thank you, gracious host. You are too kind. See you next time.